Welcome to chapter 4, The Three-Dimensional Structure of Proteins. In this lecture, we will learn about protein secondary structures. Major classes of secondary structural elements include alpha helices, beta sheets, beta turns, and random coils. A structure of a protein is shown here on the right. Now this is a tertiary structure. This includes secondary structural elements like an alpha helix, uh, a beta sheet, which is shown like an arrow, right? Now, when two of these beta strands lie close to each other, they form a beta sheet. And these are beta turns. Uh, beta turns form part of a polypeptide that connects two different structural, secondary structural elements. For example, if you can see this arrow uh, starts here and ends here. And then a turn uh, starts and then ends uh, in an alpha helix. And this is where an alpha helix starts. So this is how you read a protein structure. We'll learn about this in detail as we go along. Idealized phi and psi angles for common secondary structural elements in proteins are shown here. There are exceptions where proteins have secondary structural elements that deviate from the idealized values for phi and psi angles. However, on an average, proteins have these phi and psi angles for their structural secondary structural elements. Now let us look at these numbers in a little detail. This slide gives a representation as to how you can connect the phi and psi values of individual secondary structural elements and map them on a Ramachandran plot. For an alpha helix with a phi of minus 57 and psi of minus 47, it falls in this region so this is pretty common for an alpha helix. Uh, that is where the Ramachandran plot predicts it. For beta conformation, uh, beta sheets with an anti-parallel and parallel sheets, we'll talk about these uh, in a bit. The phi and psi angles are not much different, right? So they fall in this specific quadrant. That's the left-hand top quadrant. As you can see, we could have two different types of beta turns, right? Beta turn type one and beta turn type two. And one of them, beta turn type one, I plus one degree with a phi of minus 60 and psi of minus 30 falls in this specific location. Now, type one with I plus two with minus 90 degrees of phi and zero degrees for psi fall in this region, right? Now, one of the angle is zero, and hence it'll fall on zero. Beta turn type two is very different. Uh, both I plus one and I plus two are completely entirely different. It's minus 60 and 120 degrees for phi and psi respectively, and it falls close to a beta sheet conformation, whereas I plus two falls on the right hand quadrant and one of them since one of the angles is zero it falls on that and the other is 80 degrees so uh, I don't want you to remember any of these numbers or any of these degrees what I want you to understand is that these structural elements are different and although beta sheets uh, fall in a very uh, uh, specific regions and alpha helices fall in a specific regions beta turns are different so that's what I want you to take away from this slide the alpha helix is one of the most common secondary structure found in proteins and there are two different kinds of helices it's a left-handed helix as you can see uh, if you hold your left hand the helix would take that form the common one is a right-handed helix, as shown on the right here. 
Now this allows for hydrogen bonding between the oxygen of the carbonyl carbon and the hydrogen of NH. Helical backbone is held together by hydrogen bonds between the backbone amides of N and N plus 4 amino acids. Now, what does this mean? Let us look at this structure in detail. So this is a real structure of an alpha helix, as seen from a software called Pymol. Uh, the structure, an alpha helical content of a protein is shown here. And all these things that protrude out, those are the atoms, right? Atoms of individual amino acids. Remember, these are amino acids that form this structure. And if you can see the line, the green line that forms, goes through the center, represents the backbone. And everything that protrudes out is the side chain. Now, when I said there is hydrogen bonding between the carbonyl and the NH, this is where I meant this NH, this donates a hydrogen bond to a carbonyl of the N plus fourth residue. So this is the nth residue, N plus one. Uh, this is the nth residue, N plus one, two, three, and four. So nth residue hydrogen bonds with the N plus fourth residue. And this is along the backbone. The side chains protrude out. Now, if you view from the top of the helix, you will see that there is a hole in the center and all the side chains are protruding out. None of the side chains are inside. Remember, this is the most energetically favorable conformation because this can avoid steric repulsion. These are some facts pertaining to an alpha helix. The inner diameter of the helix without the side chains is about four to five angstroms. And when I meant the inner helix, this is this, right? This is about four to five angstroms. And an angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters, right? It's very, very small. It's too small to fit anything inside. The outer diameter, on the other hand, uh, with side chains is about 10 to 12 angstroms. And this happens to fit really well into the major groove of double-stranded DNA. Now, where does this double-stranded DNA come into picture, right? Now, if you remember, if you've taken biology, you must have heard about transcription factors. Transcription factors, which includes protein, proteins bind double-stranded DNA. Now, one way in which proteins do that is by interacting with double-stranded DNA using its alpha helices, right? A uh, classic example is zinc fingers. Now, in addition, residues one and eight align nicely on top of each other. Let's try to find residue one. Let's assume this is one, this is two, uh, this is three, this is four, this is five, uh, this is six, and there's seven and this is eight. So eight and one, they fall exactly on top of each other. That's what it means by nicely aligning on top of each other. Now this happens in uh, alpha helix. These are some points that I would want you to remember, especially for an alpha helix. Peptide bonds are aligned roughly parallel with the helical axis. So these peptide bonds are roughly parallel with the helical axis. This is the helical axis, as you can see. Side chains point out and are roughly perpendicular to the helical axis. Side chains are pointing up and are at 90 degrees. So this is the helical axis and this is where the side chains are pointing up, right? The rise of the helix is 5.4 angstroms. The rise of the helix is between this side chain and this side chain. This is called the rise of the helix. This is about 5.4 angstrom per turn because there is one turn in this rise. In a perfect alpha helix, there are 3.6 residues per turn, which translates to 1.5 angstroms per turn. So which means that 
uh, 3.6 residues in a term. The phi psi angles in an alpha helix fall in a small region on the Ramachandran plot. Phi is minus 60 and psi is minus 45 to minus 50. We have seen this before. In this light, you can see the turn of the helix and also the rise of the helix. For one turn, there are 3.6 residues per turn. And as you can see, this constitutes a turn. And the rise, as you can see, in a real alpha helix, if you calculate the distance between this C alpha uh, and this C alpha, that constitute the rise of a alpha helix. That is 5.4 angstroms. And it will have 3.6 residues in this turn, going from here to here. This slide shows four different models for the alpha helix. The first model is a ball and stick representation of the alpha helix showing interchain hydrogen bonding. And the hydrogen bonds are shown by broken blue lines between the nth residue and the n plus fourth residue. The repeat unit is a single turn of helix with 3.6 residues and a rise of 5.4 angstroms. We talked about this, right? Now, these are the different color coding for different atoms. The alpha helix can also be viewed from the top, as I told you before. Now, this ball and stick model may give you a false impression that the alpha helix is hollow, but it is not because the alpha helix, uh, the inside of the alpha helix also have atoms. Now the reason why there is a small hole-like hole -like, uh, impression is that there is the Van der Waals distance. There has to be some distance between adjacent atoms so that they don't repel each other. And this is to avoid steric clash. So this diameter that is formed here cannot fit anything. This representation of the alpha helix is called as a space filling model. Now, the atoms in the center of the alpha helix are in very close contact in this. Finally, this representation is called as a helical wheel projection. This representation can be colored to identify surfaces with particular properties. The yellow residues, for example, these ones, three, six, and two could be hydrophobic and conform to an interface between the alpha helix shown here and another part of the same or another polypeptide. The red, number four, is negatively charged and blue, positively charged, illustrate the potential for interaction of oppositely charged side chains separated by two residues in the alpha helix. Now, the color coding uh, is universal. Negative usually uh, is shown as red color and positive by blue color. So wherever you see a positive charge, it's always a blue color. And typically, yellow has a hydrophobic residues. Helix stability is dictated by the amino acid composition which plays a critical role in determining if a segment will fold into an alpha helix or not. Bulky side chain may cause steric clashes. Charge residues can promote or disfavor a helical structure depending on their orientation. Proline residues, pro means proline, proline residues which has the cyclic amino acid, has restricted phi psi rotations and no hydrogen on their NH to be involved in hydrogen bonds. Remember this, it's very important. A few more points on helix stability. Not all polypeptide sequences adopt alpha helical structures. Small hydrophobic residues such as alanine and leucine are strong helix formers. 
proline acts as a helix breaker. Remember this. The reason is because the rotation around the N C alpha bond is impossible. So proline is a helix breaker. Glycine also acts as a helix breaker because of the tiny R group supporting other conformations. Remember, glycine does not have an R group. Instead of an R group, it has a hydrogen. So the C alpha of a glycine has two hydrogens. Now, because of that, it can adopt various different conformations and is also an alpha helix breaker. Attractive or repulsive interactions between side chains three to four amino acid apart will affect formation of an alpha helix. Residues at the end of the helix may promote or disfavor helix formation depending on their properties. That's also important. The alpha helix has a dipole moment. Recall that the peptide bond has strong dipole moment with carbonyl having a negative charge and amine having a positive. All peptide bonds in the alpha helix have a similar orientation. The alpha helix thus has a large macroscopic dipole moment with negatively charged residues often, often occurring near the positive end of the helix dipole. Now, what does this figure indicate? The electric dipole of a peptide bond is transmitted along an alpha helical segment through the intra-chain hydrogen bonds, resulting in an overall helical dipole. The amino and carbonyl constituents of each peptide bonds are indicated by plus or negative symbols respectively. Non-hydrogen bonded amino and carbonyl substituents of the peptide bonds near each end of the alpha helical region are circled, as you can see. Now, what happens is the residue on the peptide amino and carbonyl groups near the amino terminal and carboxy terminal ends respectively have opposite charges, which means that at the amino terminus, right, usually at the amino terminus, you have negatively charged residues. And at carboxy terminus, you have positively charged residues. Reason is to nullify the charges. So this will cause a stabilizing interaction in an alpha helix. And thus, the residues on the ends of an alpha helix can dictate the stability of an alpha helix. Shown here is the structure of a beta strand. It is a more extended conformation of a polypeptide chain and its structure is again defined by backbone atoms arranged according to a characteristic set of dihedral angles as dictated by the phi and psi angles as we have seen before. In this beta conformation, the backbone of the polypeptide chain, as shown here, is extended into a zigzag. So this is a zigzag conformation rather than a helical structure. This brings us to beta sheets. The arrangement of several beta strand segments side by side all of which in the beta conformation is called as a beta sheet. Now, the zigzag structure of these individual beta strands gives rise to a pleated appearance of the overall sheet. A sheet-like arrangement of backbone is held together by hydrogen bonds between the backbone amides in different strands. Furthermore, the individual beta strands can be parallel or anti-parallel. This refers to the directionality of the peptide chain. The adjacent polypeptide chains in a beta sheet can be either parallel or anti-parallel, which means having the same or opposite 
amino to carboxy terminus orientation. Let us consider the anti-parallel beta sheet first. Now it has two different strands, the top strand and a bottom strand. The top strand stands for, starts from the amino terminus and goes along this direction to the carboxy terminus, whereas the bottom strand starts from the amino terminus here and goes towards the carboxy terminus. So the directionality of the peptide chain is different in anti-parallel beta sheet, whereas in parallel beta sheet, both strands have the same directionality. The amino terminus starts here and ends in the carboxy terminus. Amino terminus starts here, ends in the carboxy terminus. That's what I meant by parallel and anti-parallel. Now, the hydrogen bonding patterns are different for anti-parallel and parallel beta sheets. For anti-parallel beta sheets, the intra-strand hydrogen bond are essentially in line, as you can see, in line hydrogen bonds, whereas in parallel variant, these hydrogen bonds are not in line. Now, if you remember from chapter two, inline hydrogen bonds are much more stable as compared to the out of line hydrogen bonds. And hence, anti-parallel beta sheets are much more stable as compared to parallel beta sheets. Now, this just gives you an idea of the orientation or the directionality of beta strands. And it is usually shown as an arrow. In addition to hydrogen bonding patterns, the anti-parallel beta sheet has a longer repeat period. And it's about seven angstrom for anti-parallel anti beta sheets. Whereas in parallel beta sheets, the repeat period is only about 6.5 angstroms. When I mean repeat period, the repeat of the, uh, this is the C alpha and C alpha along the same direction. One of the common secondary structural elements formed by beta strands are beta barrels. Beta barrels are formed by various different beta strands, which are essentially a collection of beta sheets. We'll see more on beta strands later on. By now, you must have figured out that protein secondary structures are directional. To make a folded compact protein structure, we need flexibility and directional changes in the primary sequence, right? Uh, take for an alpha helix. Alpha helix is directional. Beta sheet is directional. So this is where turns come to help. Turns and loops are how proteins fold compactly. Between an alpha helix and a beta sheet, a turn is usually inserted. The beta turn is the most common turn. Some facts about beta turns. Beta turns occur frequently whenever strands in beta sheets change the direction. The 180 degree turn is accomplished over four amino acids. The turn is stabilized by a hydrogen bond from a carbonyl oxygen to an amide hydrogen, three residues down the sequence. Remember, proline in position two and or glycine in position three are common in beta turns. Very important. Now, if you remember, proline and glycine are alpha helix breakers, but they give rise to beta turns. So they do have a specific job. So these are the two types of beta turns, type one beta turn and type two beta turns. And they're distinguished by the phi and psi angles taken up by the peptide backbone. Type one turns occur more than twice as frequently as type two turns. 
Although many amino acid residues are accommodated in these terms, some biases are evident. Proline is the most common residue at position 2 in type 1 beta turn. Proline is also found in type 2 beta turns. One of the most prominent bias is the presence of glycine at position 3. So remember, glycine has R equal H, right? Both the R group is hydrogen and glycine. In both type 1 and type 2 beta turns, about 75% of the times residue 3 is a glycine. Now, one of the characteristics of beta turns is this hydrogen bond. This hydrogen bond between the carbonyl of residue 1 and the NH of residue 4. This is found in both type 1 and type 2. Now, there are isomers of proline residues found in proteins. Remember, proline is an important residue. Right? It can give rise to a specific secondary structure and it can disrupt a specific secondary structure. Most peptide bonds not involving proline are in the trans configuration. That's greater than 99.95%. For peptide bonds involving proline, about 6% are in the cis configuration. Most of this 6% involve beta turns. Proline isomerization is catalyzed by an enzyme called proline isomerase. So we end our lecture by looking at the Ramachandran plots showing a variety of secondary structural elements. As we saw before, a right-handed helix usually falls in this lower left-handed quadrant. Anti-parallel beta sheets, parallel beta sheets, and right twisted beta sheets, including collagen triple helices, form on the top left-handed quadrant. A typical exception is a left-handed helix, which forms on the top right-handed quadrant. Although left-handed helices are not known to exist uh, in proteins are theoretically possible. 